LSAC Multimedia Content The information contained in the multimedia content posted, video content, represents the views and opinions of the individuals that are speaking in the video content, the speakers. The speakers may or may not be employees of the Law School Admission Council, Inc. LSAC. The views and opinions expressed in the video content represent the views and opinions of the speakers and may not represent the views and opinions of LSAC. The appearance of video content on any LSAC-operated website is not an endorsement by LSAC or its affiliates of such video content. LSAC does not make any representations or warranties with respect to the accuracy, applicability, fitness or completeness of any video content. LSAC hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, special or any other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content, which is provided as is and without warranties of any kind. Law School Admission Council Candidate Webinar Series. Ask the Law School Deans. Recorded October 20, 2021. Good day, everyone. I'm Kelly Testy, the President and CEO of the Law School Admission Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today about uh, your opportunity to ask the law school dean and to hear directly from law school deans about the admission process and about law school. All of us at LSAC are so pleased to be able to bring this webinar to you. We work very closely with all the law schools around the United States and around the world to help advance your learning journey and your enrollment journey for legal education. So one of the things that I just like to start with is making sure you know that we want you to take this journey. Uh, we need your voice in law. There's so much justice that we still need to bring to our world. And we're glad that you've tuned in and that you're here to learn directly from law school deans about this opportunity. So I really appreciate you joining us today, whether you're from the West Coast or the East Coast or somewhere outside the United States, we're glad to have you with us. And I wanna let you know too, that my staff at LSAC will make an effort to answer questions that you put in the Q&A and they'll post some that we'll answer live today. As uh, we get into that, I wanna let you know that I'm gonna begin by letting you know the deans that we have with us. And I'll just briefly let you know who's here and then I'll turn to my first question to them. So I wanna thank my Dean colleagues for joining me today. We have first Erwin Chimerinsky, who is serving as Dean at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. So welcome, Dean Chemerinsky. I'm also today very honored to welcome Dean Camille Davidson, who's joining us from Southern Illinois University School of Law. Very happy to have you with us, Dean Davidson. Welcome. And I'm very pleased to welcome Linda Green, who I've known for a long time. I was so pleased when she joined Michigan State University as the Dean of the Law School. Uh, Dean Green, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. What a pleasure. And I'm equally delighted to welcome Ted Ruger, who is there very close to LSAC's headquarters at the University of Pennsylvania's Carey School of Law. Dean Ruger, welcome. Happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Kelly. So what I'd like to do is begin by asking each of the deans to just introduce uh, themselves to you, sharing a little bit about what brought them to law and how they then made their journey uh, to becoming a law school dean. And so I'll just go in that same order, uh, alphabetical that we began with and first turn it to uh, Dean Chemerinsky. Thank you, Kelly, so much. It's really an honor to be part of this program. I grew up on the South side of Chicago in a working class family. I was the first in my family to go to college. Neither my parents nor brother sister went to college. If you had talked to me when I was in college, I'd have told you what I wanted to be was a high school teacher. I took all of the classes and did my student teaching, to become a high school teacher, but then decided I wanted to go to law school to be a civil rights lawyer. I was very much inspired by the civil rights lawyers of the 1950s and the 1960s. And I continue to handle civil rights cases as a law professor and as a dean, arguing appeals in the lower courts, occasionally in the Supreme Court. But after practicing for a time, I realized my real passion was for teaching and through a series of coincidences, I was very fortunate to fall into a teaching position. And I went home after my first class in August of 1980 and said to my wife, this is what I wanna do forever. I wanna be a law professor. And I finished class this morning at 10 o'clock Pacific time. And I walked out thinking, this is what I wanna do forever, continue to be a law professor. Um, it's a long career and there's a chance to do many things. I decided to become a dean in part because I think it's an opportunity to make a difference 
think deans can make a difference in their institutional legal education, in part because I knew that I would grow and learn a lot from the experience. Thank you so much, Dean Chemerinsky. And uh, are we ever glad you pursued that, that pathway? It's uh, great to, to hear from you. Dean Davidson, I uh, want to welcome you and, uh, and turn the mic to you to introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Kelly. I grew up in Oxford, Mississippi, the child of educators, and I never, ever thought that I would be an educator. I wanted to be an attorney. I was that person who thought that I could save the world. I went to law school because that's what I was going to do. When I graduated from law school, I went to Capitol Hill and worked for six years. And I was the trailing spouse, went kicking and screaming to Charlotte, North Carolina. I met my husband in law school and so ended up in private practice for a while. And after 13 years, decided to teach. I guess it was in my blood after all. After saying no three times, I took the role of associate dean for faculty development, followed by associate dean for academic affairs. And after that, I thought, you know what? I feel like I have a lot to offer. Let's go out on this dean search circuit and see what might happen. And last year, I joined the Southern Illinois University School of Law as dean. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yes, you have a lot to offer. That might be the understatement of the of the year. It's great to have you with us. And Dean Linda Green now, welcome you and uh, ask you to introduce yourself. Thank you. I give a shout out to my uh, Dean of my law school, Berkeley, Erwin. It's always great to be with you. Great. I uh, was born in California and my uh, parents uh, were, my mother was college educated and my father uh, was in the Navy. I say parenthetically about my father, the smartest man I've ever met. And we lived in the South uh, for my first eight years uh, in segregated schools in uh, both New Orleans and also in Virginia. And when I was eight, my parents decided that we would grow up in California where my uh, mother's family was migrating uh, from Arkansas. And so I completed my education in California. I'm public educated, uh, public high schools, uh, public universities, uh, and also, of course, UC Berkeley. Uh, we call it Berkeley Law. Uh, and, and why did I go to law school? I was a product of the 60s and early 70s. Uh, there was so much social change. There was so much uh, that we needed to do to bring the promise of citizenship to all people in America. And so I went to law school to play a role in that. Quite frankly, I wasn't sure exactly what role I would play, but I did know that law school is a place where we learn about the distribution of public and private power, not only in the United States, but in the world, the intersection between private and public interests and how society decides to allocate power to arrange for dispute resolution. So I knew that that would be the case. And I had heard about some lawyers who had participated in beginning to change the world, Thurgood Marshall, William Hastie, Charles Houston, uh, many others. And I thought, wow, maybe that's something I could do. I was very lucky. Uh, I did a series of things in law school that, uh, per that set me up for the opportunity to join the law firm that Charles Houston and Thurgood Marshall founded, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which has participated in uh, most of the cases involving a change in the area of race uh, in the country since the 1930s. And so that was a great opportunity. And then for most of my career, I have been a law professor. I began uh, as a civil rights and constitutional litigator in the New York uh, firm, uh, doing cases all over the United States in housing discrimination, in employment discrimination, and also death penalty cases as well. I next was a counsel to a big city, the city of Los Angeles, where I specialized in civil and constitutional rights issues, giving advice to 30 departments, 34 departments in the city uh, of the city of Los Angeles. And then I began teaching. And for the most part, I have been a law professor, but I've done some other things along the way. 
I was a counsel to the United States Senate Judiciary Committee, the committee that, uh, among other things, uh, decides on whether nominees, the president's nominees to the Supreme Court will actually be seated on that court. I had that experience. I uh, also uh, was able to become involved in a couple of presidential campaigns as a senior advisor. Uh, during my law teaching career, which has been long and wonderful, I've also had the chance to be uh, a senior administrator at two universities, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where, where I was an associate vice chancellor in charge of faculty strategic hiring and a number of other areas, and also at the University of California, San Diego, uh, where I was a vice chancellor. So I've had these uh, administrative roles. I've also been a volunteer in many fantastic organizations, both within legal education and out of legal education. What I would say, and I just talked to some prospective students just yesterday, our Black Law Students Association has a partnership with the Pre-Law Black Students Association. And I just talked to those students. And what I said in sum is that the law is a fantastic profession. The horizon keeps changing. There are so many opportunities that you will have as a lawyer and the opportunity for personal growth and also the opportunity to help people's dreams come true to serve the diverse communities of our country is never ending. So I am just as excited about uh, being involved in law as I was when I walked up the steps uh, to Berkeley Law School. I joke with them. I had a new mini dress. I had my fro was perfectly coiffed and I had some high heel sandals. And I just remembered even today, the excitement I felt stepping in the door and that excitement has never left. And I guarantee you that if you join us on this journey, that you will find that you will learn so much about yourself, about this world. And most importantly, you'll be able to serve uh, people and help our country's dreams come true. Thank you so much, Dean. And wow, it is, it's wonderful to hear that excitement. And I hear in so many of you that that's part of what's so fun about law is that it's just always a challenge. There's some new things to do. And it's wonderful to hear that. Uh, Dean Ruger, let me get you in on this. Uh, introduce yourself uh, and uh, let us know a little bit about your own journey. Thank you. And I, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Ted Ruger. Um, de currently dean and I've been long for, for about the past uh, 18 years a professor at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School in Philly, uh, dean the last seven years. Um, and my path, I, I realized listening and following on my distinguished colleagues and I second it and everything they said, maybe growing up in the Midwest or South is a risk factor for becoming a dean. Uh, I grew up outside of St. Louis uh, Public High School and uh, um, like my colleagues, although we grew up in slightly different times, uh, slightly different decades. You know, I was thinking, you know, in, in the 1980s when there were much like today, huge inequalities of wealth, huge problems of inclusion, lack of inclusion. You know, there was something that motivated me to think that uh, our, our democracy was not as uh, functioning as well. It was not as equal. It was not as inclusive as it should have been. And I went to law school because of that. With And, and so one thing I would amplify that all my colleagues said, and I'd say to all the all the future law students, the kind of emotions you feel, the, the, the sense of injustice, that is so important. And I always say to our one else, we might teach you to think, hopefully we teach you to think a little more like a lawyer, but it's your, don't, the law is not uh, segregated from emotion, from your sense that something's wrong, even from anger, sometimes that can, that's what drives the best lawyers. And obviously we want to channel it. Obviously we want to take care of our mental health because our profession sometimes our sense of injustice can turn inward in ways that we're all, at all of our law schools we're working on. But so that drove me as well. Now I thought actually I would get the tools from law school and either be out there as a government lawyer, maybe run for office, maybe be a public defender, be right there on the front lines. And uh, what happened along the way was I just found law school so darn interesting. Um, like the, and, and the intellectuals, yes, I can still work on these issues and have uh, um, with colleagues, but like the, I just want to, it's law school is so interesting and it's even more interesting than when any of us were in law school because now you learn psychology sociology uh history um you know medicine you know we we draw on the whole university 
to help you understand the structures of equality and inequality in our society, to help you understand what motivates people. It's such a rich curriculum. It's so fun. I mean, so besides the sense of justice that we bring, it's intellectually really fun to be in a law school these days. And, and, uh, and that's probably why I've stayed. And, um, and, and so um, it's, I feel very fortunate to be where I am. That's, that's terrific. And uh, it is great to see the schools continuing to innovate, you know, adding a lot more clinical opportunities, all kinds of things that really uh, engage students in, uh, in, in the work of being, uh, you know, doing justice really from the, from the get go. Um, let me ask you this, Deans, I want to follow up on some of those great points about your backgrounds, but, but I also want to maybe before I do that, ask a question that's, that goes more to the admission process itself. Um, you know, a lot of people watching today are getting ready to apply, maybe for next fall or the fall thereafter. And so I want to pose a broad question and ask each of you to respond. And maybe you can pick up on different parts of it and build on, on each other to provide some good advice. But um, we're getting questions, and I'll, and I'll start, Camille, just so you know, I'll ask you to respond first, and then we'll go around. But we're getting a lot of questions about things like, hey, I'm an international student. Am I welcome in your school? I'm an older student. Are you looking for that? What do you really suggest, you know, I, I, make my, I use to make myself stand out? Um, you know, what is your school really thinking about when they're reviewing all these applications, you know, in terms of, of what you're looking for? So I wonder if you uh, each might take a, a, a swipe at that broad question about, you know, what is it that the schools are really looking for as you are bringing in your class of students? And, and are there uh, particular things you'd like to emphasize on that? And uh, Dean Davidson, I'll go to you first and, and then move to, uh, uh, to Linda and then to Ted and then to Irwin. Thanks, Kelly. So SIU was founded in the public interest to serve the public good. And so many of our graduates go on to be state's attorneys, small firm practitioners. And we have in less than 50 years, a plethora of judges because that appears to be a, a, a wonderful ascension in your career path. So thinking about that, as we look at the applications of our students, we do tend to look a lot at students who are interested in public service, who identify that on their resumes. But beyond that, we look for people to bring their authentic selves. And so as we are reviewing the applications, we are looking and reading about the backgrounds of, of the individuals. L um, last year when I arrived, our faculty together created and issued a um, diversity statement and an anti-racism statement because we wanted to signal to all who apply, regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, ability, physical ability, we wanted to make sure that we provided a nurturing environment and that our applicants knew that that was an environment where they could excel and that they would have the support to unlock their human potential. And so we are looking for diamonds in the rough always. We have a holistic application. So we, while we look at the LSAT score, we look at the classes that you've taken, we look at what you've done with your time, either during your undergraduate career, if you've had some time after law school, after undergraduate and before law school, we look at those things as well. So really looking to see that well-rounded individual who has a passion or an interest and can demonstrate that in their application. That's excellent. Thank you for that good start. And I, I know a lot of applicants are asking, you know, is, is the LSAT score the only thing you look at? And I know all of you do holistic admission. You look at a lot of things and those, those scores you publish are, are median. So that means that half the students are above them and half below them. And so that's a wide range. And I want to make sure the candidates know where we see them as, as whole people. Linda, maybe you can expand on that and talk a little bit about uh, you know, what sure. you're thinking about as you do admission. Sure. We have uh, just uh, this summer revised our application to uh, 
change a diversity statement that was optional to one that is an integral part of the application. And the reason that we did that is we wanted to be clear that we are looking for a diverse student body, that all of those experiences of people from the arts to archeology, span uh, whatever you have studied, that kind of diversity is very, very important to us. But we're also specifically interested in how you think diversity is important to the legal profession. What contributions have you already made to diversity in your life? How have you uh, experienced questions of diversity in your life? So we, we are looking for that um, student body who will become the next generation of lawyers who will be able to serve the diverse communities of our state and this nation. We need to, uh, to develop a next generation of leaders who understand how important it is for legal services and legal access to be available and affordable for all people in the United States, no matter what. Uh, so, so we're very excited ab about that. We're admitting holistically, uh, but I would maybe a practical tip might be to say, be sure that we hear what you have done to prepare yourself for law school. So that's one question I think that ought to be addressed. Second, be sure to say how you think your presence in the law school class would be um, beneficial, uh, would enhance the education of your colleagues, enhance the content of what we do. Because remember, we're preparing a next generation of lawyers to make dreams come true. A third is to say, what will you do with this precious law degree? This is a very important privilege to have the chance to get a legal education. And so how do you plan to use this degree uh, to better society? And it's your, um, your idea. And, and it gives us a chance to know how we should allocate this scarce resource of legal education for the benefit of society. So those are a couple of things that are, are really important. Very helpful, Dean. Thank you so much. And uh, Dean Ruger, let me go to you. And uh, as I do that, there's some other questions related coming in about, should I do gap year? Should I not? What if I don't know exactly what area of law I want to go into? So any of those things that you want to work into your comments too, I sure. know would be helpful. Um, well, like my colleagues, I think we're very committed to uh, bringing people from all backgrounds into law school with and that of course is both an admissions and a financial aid imperative um and we look very widely for for law students um you know we have a class of about 300 this year that's bigger than normal but they come from over 150 different undergraduate institutions which gives you a sense even you know we're a school that you know situated i guess as a quote ivy league unquote school and but we are not a you know there's a in a, it like at least at the law school here we draw from you know all 150 plus schools there's probably 250 represented in all three years and that's and so um and that's really important to us um to amplify what you said kelly as well that we're talking when you see the numbers we're talking about medians and i would even say um you know we look for your talent we want to we want to find outstanding people and so you know if you're somebody who and you know had some tough years as, as I did my first year of college, but you know, did uh, did pretty well on the on the test. That's good, you know. If you if you're somebody who uh, doesn't test well and, and was just a really great student, that that is good too. You're not going to be held back, uh, you know. And, and we try to try to find a way to get the talented students we want. Um, and we are very selective, but it's. Uh, I would say now to the point about a gap year. Um, well, actually, the easiest question to answer, and I'm sure all the other deans would agree. You do not know, and this is a great luxury of law school, unlike PhD programs, I'm like, you do not know, you need to know what you want to be, what, what, you know, and indeed, in something that you will regard as a gift, it may not seem it now. We tell you what classes you're supposed to teach, uh, I mean, supposed to, uh, supposed to take, at least you're in the fall, there's a little bit of optionality. So, like, it's actually, you don't have to decide, and it's wonderful, because you can just immerse yourself in the classes and with your classmates, and, and I would, 
urge all of you, you know, if you're agnostic as I was, you know, um, it's great if you know exactly what you want to do, but still be open minded. But you don't need to know. And that's a, that's different than some other graduate programs. And then lastly, so here's what I would say. I don't I would never recommend a student who thinks that it's the right time to go to law school to do a gap year or two or three or four. What I can say empirically, and this is true of a, certainly a number of this here, here at Penn and a lot, um, about 75% of our students are not direct from undergrad when they show up here. As an, and that's higher than it would have been a decade ago and probably higher than two. So, um, but I would say, unlike say MBA programs, we don't require that or even put a huge thumb on the scale. I mean, again, it's hard to say because we do holistic whole file review. If you're doing something really important and impactful between undergrad and law school, we're going to notice it. We want to hear about it. Um, but, you know, like all of my colleagues here, we certainly take some fabulous students right out of undergrad. But just I would say so there's the that's the admissions answer in terms of your enjoyment, not in just enjoyment, your success in law school. And I, you know, many of us taking a year or two might make you um, almost energize you again to be back in the classroom. Um, so that's not an admissions advantage per se it's a it's it's just all of you watching this thinking about your own life cycle and would would it benefit you to not be in the academy for a little bit I, i'll tell you what working a, as i did working a real job makes you appreciate classes and homework a lot more so um so just think about that as you plan your next few years it's a really great point. You know, I, I had about five years in between undergrad and law. And when I got back to law school, I just felt like a kid in a candy store. I was so happy to be in school and really just loved it. So I think, you know, you're starting to hear that there's no one pathway, lots of pathways. As, and then as Dean Green talked about, explain why you've picked the one you have. You know, what is it that, how's it fit in with where you think you'd love to, to, to go and contribute to the class? Dean Chemerinsky, I want to uh, open this up to you for any advice you have uh, about the admission process. And uh, I know Berkeley does a lot of global work too. So if you have any thoughts, particularly about international students, that would be welcome as well. So of course, it's interesting. I listened to Camille and Linda and Ted, how similar we're all trying to do as we admit students. We're all looking to have a class that's diverse in every way. And also looking for people who we think are going to be outstanding lawyers and outstanding law students contributing to the profession and the school. To say the obvious, but nobody has said it, we're always looking at five things in admissions. I can't lie, we do look at LSAT and GPA, but Kelly's point is important. What you see is a median, and half is below the median, half is above the median. Those are important, but they're not determinative. It's holistic review. We look very carefully at the letters of recommendation. And I think it's important to have academic letters of recommendation, especially professors who can talk about your analytical and writing ability. We look carefully at your personal statement, and it's worth working hard to make sure that it's a very well-written statement that reflects how you want to present yourself in law schools. And we're also looking at your life experience and what you're going to be bringing. Each of you has a different journey than anyone else. Talk about that and why you want to go to law school, and what you're looking to do in your career. Ted is absolutely right. Most people come to law school without knowing what they want to do with their law degree. And many who think they want to do something will change their mind along the way. You don't have to declare a major in law school, not before you start or ever. And Kelly, to answer your specific question, we are very open to international students. We always have a couple of dozen international students in our first year JD class as well as we have a large LLM program. And the international students enrich the school. Their diversity helps us all learn about what's going on in other countries and other legal systems. So there is no one path. We're not looking for any particular type of person. In fact, we're looking for many different kinds of people because that's how everyone will learn best. Very good, thank you so much. And uh, I uh, want to stress too that, you know, Dean Chemerinsky mentioned the LLMs. Uh, a lot of the schools have, you know, not only the JD degree, the LLM degree, but increasingly law schools are engaging in a lot of education of master's degrees in law. Some that are targeted to particular subject matters like compliance or employment or technology. And so for those of you listening, you know, take a look at what all the law schools are doing. There's a, a wide range of legal education that's available out there depending upon, upon your interest. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep pulling from some of the questions I'm seeing and also some that I have for these great deans. And uh, Dean Ruger, I want to uh, pose this one to you at this time. And that is to, um, there's a number of questions about innovation in law and technology in law and changes in law. And I know, you know, from our conversations about some of the initiatives you have uh, going on at Penn. So I wonder if you might uh, share your thoughts with the audience about you know, sort of where law is headed right now and some of the changes you're seeing. Sure. I, it's so exciting and it's a chance for lawyers to work with uh, computer programmers and sociologists and that we work with the Wharton School here. And uh, I guess I could say, let me first talk, I guess, what's happening out there in the field of, of law and policy and representing clients. And, and so what we're seeing is um, uh, the use of tools of technology, both to lower the cost of legal services and expand access and reach people who might not be, you know, we have a, a legal, uh, somebody, many of us know, Jim Sandman, who's uh, here at the law school teaching for a few years after leaving the head of Legal Services Corporation of America and Jim and, and the, the, this is kind of the, the country's leading public service or uh, lawyering organization. And they've issued reports, I commend them to you all, that talks about the, the huge justice gap. We, we have, we're producing a lot of lawyers, but there's as many as 80% of people in this country can't afford or can't access a lawyer. It's certainly people at or below the poverty line, but lots of people above the poverty line as well. So one thing that innovation happens, and it could be a phone app that helps people with personal bankruptcy, which one of our alums is working on. It could be uh, what we're doing right here, accessing more people through uh, Zoom or other video technology. Um, we want to be a thought leader and, and have law schools and, and, and the LSAC, frankly, actually one thing you've done with, um, and you've been a leader in ways uh, that, that many of the state bar exams have followed, Kelly, in, uh, in, in uh, online examination, which something as simple as that might help more people come to law school and, and pr produce more, a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. So technology is not just a, an end of itself, that's important, but it's to try to expand access. Um, the, the only other thing, actually, I should, I'll defer to my deans on this, uh, my colleagues, but then there's the whole way that it's changing legal education. And so that I think we're all thinking and working with our faculties um, about how we will build some virtuality in what I think all of us probably intend to be a predominantly in-person legal education, but not 100%, because all of you, when you're lawyers, are going to be practicing some in-person, but also some uh, virtually and remotely. Very helpful. Thank you. And Dean Davidson, maybe I could ask you to follow up on that. Uh, we have some questions, you know, particularly about how the pandemic has impacted legal education and and just your thoughts on on that impact and, and just how students uh, that are starting school now might expect to see any changes from that going forward. Indeed, I think the pandemic has taught us that we can do some things that we didn't think we were equipped to do prior to the pandemic. Like Dean Ruger said, we are looking really deliberately about the various ways that we can deliver legal education. Of course, most of us on the Zoom, when we went to law school, it was a traditional nine to 4.30, Monday through typically Thursday, maybe Friday, legal education experience. But now there are so many other ways that we can deliver education to our students. There are so many other opportunities that are available to our students. And so the silver lining in the pandemic was that we can now see that we can add a level of virtual education in some of our upper, upper level courses. Some of our clinics were able to use distance education as well. Our clinics serve some rural counties in Illinois. So rather than having students and or faculty drive two to three hours to handle a status hearing. We now realize we can have computers in schools and senior centers so that we can have, you know, a, a will um, orientation session with the client, with the student sitting at school and the client three hours away. So looking at those wonderful opportunities now. That's excellent. Thank you very much for that. I want to turn to uh, Dean Green with, with this question. And uh, we've had a number of candidates, you know, asking questions about the role of law in our society generally. You know, you referred to how important it is for law to be a pathway to justice and to, uh, and its relationship to democracy more broadly. And a lot of candidates are asking, you know, do I get a sense of that when I'm in law school, you know, or is it just that I'm in the books? 
So how would you say law school allows students to have that vision into the larger role of law in society? Well, first, of course, uh, we have all been affected by the, um, the realities that have been brought to the surface during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've also had since, uh, not just since the death of George Floyd, but we've also had our awareness that there's a racial pandemic as well. And then we have seen so much in society that where law will play a role in uh, creating change in our society. So it's just so relevant today. I was just making some notes on some areas. As, as law schools, we want to be on the cutting edge to prepare our students to practice law. Okay, you're sitting down for 50 more years. So we know that the world is going to change during your law practice and it's changed during our involvement as, in law. So what we wanna do is give you the foundation uh, to understand not only what the law is, but how the law is changing and how society dictates and influences changes in law. And so we, we, we're we saying it's not just for today, it's the preparation for a lifelong uh, a career of learning and growing. And we wanna provide you that foundation, which is an attitude about learning and challenging. I always say, if you can live with the ambiguity that is a part of the legal system, then you're gonna love the law because we have some things where we know the answers. But if I talk about intellectual property, tech, privacy, uh, Think about the fact that now our athletes, our NCAA athletes have intellectual property rights in their name, image, and likeness. That's all true. What about what's happening with reproductive equality in the country with the Supreme Court is on the front lines and in every legislature uh, around the country, we see these issues about the role of women in society, about control of reproduction. These are all still cutting edge. What about algorithms that uh, distinguish or, or, or sort people out on a race grounds? What about the power of government to address the COVID uh, crisis? This has been on the front. What's the power of governors, the power of the president, the power of, a, of AGs, the power of local government? So with every, you almost say, take the headlines and read them. And there are legal issues embedded in everything that is happening on our society today. So, it, and, and 50 years from now, there'll be different issues and you'll be senior attorneys and you'll be just as uh, excited as some of us uh, who are at that stage about those issues. So there's just the, the world, we have interplanetary treaties now The war about how we use space, about weapons in space. So, you know, this is, um, you know, from Captain Kirk, you know, going up, <laughs> going up in a rocket, all those issues are front and center, and there's going to be no shortage. And, and if we are doing our job as professors and as legal education institutions, we're going to bring those emerging issues to you as you take your classes. So yes, you may be learning about law that was developed in the 16th century, but you will also be talking about where that area of law will need to go to meet the needs of society. To me, that is, would be what would be an ideal law school environment for the next generation of leaders. Absolutely. And those questions are just, you know, all over, like you say in the newspaper, you know, you could add, you know, pick up any, any column up. and you can add another example to that. And, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of questions coming in about, you know, do I have to major in a particular thing? And, and the answer is no, you know, that's the, the beauty of law school. That one, no. we, we take the poets and the physicists, the music majors and the math majors, you know, and, and the reason athletes, is that athletes, athletes uh, veterans, people are asking about military service and mothers and fathers, mothers and fathers, people that have been out long, out of a while. Veterans. Absolutely. That's right. And that, that diversity is what makes law strong because we need people that can look at these complex problems from every angle. 
and be able to say, well, you know, my background helps me see it this way, but my background helps me see it that way. And then working on, on resolving those, those areas. So it's, um, it's something that I think is important. And uh, Ted, did you have a follow-up that, that you want to make? I have a small point that, that I know. Yeah, please. And it applies, I know, to all of, all of, my, all of the schools represented on this call. I think you know, there might have been a time, maybe uh, a decade or two or more ago, where people, law schools kind of assumed a certain background and assumed that people had the, the writing skills, the reading skills case. We know now, because we value different backgrounds, intellectual backgrounds, demographic, you know, that we, we've we all kind of ramped up in our intentionality starting really even before day one, usually a week before, at if not more, at kind of what we would call legal practice skills. We used to call it legal writing. But so there's a support structure outside the um, uh, sort of core one up curriculum, and then it continues through that is, in, is recognizes that people come from so many different backgrounds. So we don't, you know, if you're not used to taking uh, so-called blue book exams, which of course aren't on a blue book, but you know, essay exams, put it that way. Okay, we've got, we're gonna help you with that. If you didn't write a bunch of papers in college because you majored in something that had multiple choice tests, that's fine, we're gonna make sure. So we're all doing that and just, uh, and the extra kind of skills training is really important to all of us. Good, thank you for that addition. It's very helpful and, and really important. And we always try and help students see too that you know, the LSAT and looking at reading skills, writing skills and reasoning skills is trying to go at the core of what can help you learn to learn. But the schools are also adding things that help build each of those skills too. And so that just shows that you know, then you, you can say, okay, these are areas I wanna work on. Uh, other people may, you know, you may be great at math and other people will have to work on math. You know, there, there's always that, that mix that, that happens. Dean Chimerinsky, I want to come back to you. Um, one of the questions that particularly was, was being asked for some advice from you is people have noted, you know, what a great advocate you are when so knowledgeable about the Supreme Court. You see a lot of lawyers in action. And they're asking, you know, in your view, what is it that makes a, a good lawyer? You know, what are the, some of the things that, that you find important to thrive in law school? And then on into the profession as you're doing the work that the, the wide variety of work that lawyers can do. A great question. When I think of the great lawyers I had the chance to observe, they all have some characteristics in common. They all have passion for what they're doing. I don't think you can be successful at what you do unless you really care about it. They're all tremendously conscientious because I think a great deal about law practice and law school too is the attention to detail in doing the work. And also I think that they're all individuals who are compassionate and ethical. Maybe there are great lawyers who don't have the skill, but the ones that I've seen that I really regard are people who are compassionate to others and are scrupulous in their ethics. Very good, very good. I appreciate that. And Dean Davidson, I'm gonna come back to you for a minute too. Uh, some questions about the actual experience in law school itself. Uh, the student, the uh, candidates are noting that a lot of, uh, you know, all of us wanna welcome diverse students to our, to our schools. How's the climate in the school for students supporting each other? Is, you know, what's it feel like to be a law student and uh, today? Sure, I think the support for students is both peer-to-peer -peer support as well as faculty support. And I'm not sure that existed a decade or two or three ago. So in addition to the programs that Dean Ruger talked about, the lawyering fundamental programs that take place typically before school starts to try to level the playing field, if you will, we make sure that we have opportunities through our student organizations for peer-to-peer networking, peer-to-peer -peer accountability, and peer-to-peer -peer find your posse, your social group, your network group, the group that's going to be there when you're having a fabulous day and cheer you on, the group that's going to be there when you're having the worst day of your life because you were called on and you were not prepared. So um, registered student organizations that really uh, span every single area that you can imagine, whether it's affinity groups based on race such as BALSA, HILSA, whether it's LGBTQ plus organizations, whether it's based on politics, Federalist Society, Young Democrats, Young Republicans, you can find your place in space 
within the institution. And I think that's the exciting part, along with the structured academic support programs that are in place now. Also, we didn't have midterm examinations when I was in law school. And now many, many schools, including ours, uh, we have midterms for our first year students. So students are able to get some early feedback so they know right away, hey, I'm not doing quite as well as I thought I was doing in contracts, so I need to double down a little bit. So that early information is very helpful. Right Absolutely. Out, right out. Absolutely. Thank you. And I love that when you walk in any law school, you'll see all the the meetings of all the various organizations. Each law school has so many different student organizations, so each student can find an affinity group, you know, that whatever that might be for that particular person and find some support and a good network. And I do think it's uh, the case that legal ed is growing stronger all the time by giving more support for students. And that's something that I really am thrilled to see. And speaking of support, I want to, before I turn to some closing comments from our deans, I want to remind all of you that in every law school, there is an admission office. And in that admission office are wonderful people who are there on the front lines to help you learn about the admission process and about financial aid, which is really important, and about how to take that step to learn about schools and make you know, your decision and find your way into that school. And so I just want to make sure you know that you know, LSAC works very closely with all those uh, professionals that are out in the law schools doing the enrollment work and they are terrific and they're there to help you. So reach out and get to know them, let them know your questions. And don't forget too that lsac.org is the first place where you can start if you don't know where to go. We're there, we have all kinds of people and email on the phones just there to help you with your journey. So please know that that's what we're here for is easing that journey into law school and helping you be successful and we want you to be. And so that's what we're there for. And so you let me know, you let us know how we can help too. I want to uh, give each Dean an opportunity and uh, Dean Ruger, I'll start with you just to share any kind of closing comments you want without me asking you a particular question. So anything you'd like to share today with the candidates um, before uh, we have to close, close out today that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a, a as a, a dean who's excited about legal education, I could filibuster the whole time, and I won't. So just quickly, I think what I what we've haven't talked as much about is the component part of the cor correlation between and, and the the way that we're all trying to expand and have expanded financial aid in addition to the admissions decision. So for all of the law schools on this call, and really any that you guys would be thinking about. Yes, you should look at the quote sticker price for tuition, but at, at all of our institutions, very few, a lot of students don't pay the, that. And we've, we're all working really hard on need-based, in some cases, merit-based education, uh, financial aid to bring down the actual cost. And so don't let, the, don't let the, 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 the visible cost deter you. Now, the flip side is we've also gotten a lot better, all law schools, at um, sharing data about uh, average debt, average salary, job placement rates. So you can really be educated consumers. Um, the ABA collects this, we all post it, but look for things like job placement rates, uh, the, the debt that people have, um, and um, it'll help you pick, I think, the right law school um, because, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, we're all committed and we all understand that legal education is getting too expensive and we're all working to bring it down at our institutions and nationally and that's not always going to show up when you just look at our website. You may have to, once you have some choices, think about what's best for you financially. But then you can really look at the data on the schools because we all, and, and all, all the deans on this call, I think, support the notion that we want to be more transparent and share things about finances, debt, job placement. Good. Dean Ruger, thank you so much for being with us. And that, uh, that's great advice for the students. And, uh, and I love that transparency that's, uh, that I agree with you is on the on the in increase and that's terrific. Dean Chemerinsky, let me go to you for anything that you would like to share um, uh, that we may not have had time to talk about today or just some advice you'd like to give the candidates that are watching today. I thought I'd address something we haven't talked about. Why should someone wanna be a lawyer at this moment in time? And there's many reasons. I think it's a chance to make a difference in people's lives, often at the most difficult moments of their lives. When you're representing a criminal defendant, 
or someone in a divorce or someone in a very difficult personal situation like after a family death, you really can help. It is a profession that allows you to do that. It's a chance to make an enormous difference in our society and the world. When you think of the largest problems that are facing our society now, problems that we've talked about in this call in terms of systemic racism, in terms of climate change, it's lawyers who are really working on that. I went to law school over 40 years ago because I believe that law was the most powerful tool for social change. I continue to believe that. Also, law is inherently intellectually interesting. You'll never get bored. And it's also the chance to do so many different things over the course of a career. So I think that the attraction of law is the chance to make a difference and the chance to grow as a person. That doesn't make law school necessarily the right thing for everybody. Obviously, you have to always think about what would you do instead? But I think this is a great time to go to law school and use law really to make a difference in people's lives in the world. Thank you so much, Dean. I uh, once had a lawyer tell me that he thought of a law degree as a license to help people. <laughs> and, uh, and I love that. It's uh, somewhat in the spirit of your, of your comments. So thank you very much. Dean Davidson, let me go to you for your closing comments and then I'll go to Dean Green. And Dean Green, I have one particular question for you to, as well as we close out today. So Dean Davidson, first to you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to answer the question of if I don't get into my dream school, should I still go to law school? So often when I talk to prospective law school applicants, they think they know where they want to go. And if they can't get in, then the world is coming to an end. And so I would just challenge everyone to think outside the box about what it is you want to do with that degree. Because Many, many schools offer opportunities to students that you may not get in other places. Many schools have honors programs where the top students are given access to particular job experiences, speakers, networking opportunities. So allow yourself to think about what it is that you want to do with that law degree and don't just limit yourself to if I don't get into a T14 school, I'm just not going to do it at all. There are a lot of opportunities out there for everyone. There sure are. It's something that I just think about every day, how lucky I am to work with all the law schools. Um, it's just so every time you get to know one, you're, you're impressed by, wow, look what all they have going on. And finding that fit is really critical. So thank you. And Dean Green, I wanted to give you a chance for closing comments, but I also wanted to tag one thing on, and that is that some of the commentators ask a question I had in my mind, which is, how, do you, how did you not feel intimidated when you were working at the firm where Thurgood Marshall had worked? <laughs> <laughs> oh. how, did you, how did you navigate that? So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first, the culture, the culture of that law firm was a very uh, inclusive of the ideas of the youngest people in the firm, uh, as well as the older people in the firm who work side by side with Thurgood Marshall. But they also had an amazing network of lawyers all over the country who have always been a part. And that's always been a multi-generational network. And the culture was to let the young people try things out and be a part of a legal team and have their ideas drive that. But you're working side by side with experienced people who knew how important it was to give this next generation of lawyers all the encouragement they needed in order to continue the work that began in the 1930s. Uh, so I, all, while in law school, I will maybe close with this, while in law school, I um, had a strategic plan for my law school uh, career. And, um, and part of the strategic plan not only involved uh, making sure that I took a wide range of courses. Uh, I, I was a tax nerd in law school. I took four tax courses, but I also was a teaching assistant to a professor who was teaching constitutional and civil rights. I was a, 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 a teaching, I was a, a, um, a research assistant to my tax professor. I, I, 
I did, uh, I found judges to meet. I worked for a prominent civil rights lawyer. I had a wide variety of experiences, but my strategic plan always had me ask myself, where do I have weaknesses? How do I need to grow? Are there people I'm uncomfortable speaking with? And I would take, uh, I was confident, but I knew I had weaknesses and I would move in the direction of my weaknesses to move to tackle those weaknesses rather than staying in my comfort zone. And I guess what I would say is that when we acknowledge our fears and yet we address them and we move to conquer them, then the best is really yet to come for not only you as lawyers, but also for society. Because as a lawyer, you're gonna be challenged. There are gonna be times when you don't know as a law student as well. But guess what? We as lawyers are comfortable knowing that we don't know all the answers, but we're also equally comfortable knowing that if we dig and if we work, that we will find the best answers possible at this time. Maybe 20 years from now, a different generation of lawyers will have better answers. But that idea that we don't know the answers, but we're willing to jump in 100% work, uh, it, it's just a part of the profession and, and it's the most fantastic thing. We're all saying, we're all continuing to grow as people, even though you would say, oh, you're a dean, you're there. No, we are learning every day, especially with the COVID and trying to keep legal education going in these circumstances. Every day is a learning experience for us. And that's why we're so excited. And we want you to be a part of that uh, that experience. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. That's right. And uh, that is what is so fun about law is that chance to keep growing. Well, I can't thank you all enough, Deans. We've. I want to remind you, we have Dean Ted Ruger from Penn. We have Dean Linda Green from Michigan State. We have Dean Erwin Chimarinsky from UC Berkeley. We have Dean Camille uh, Davidson from Southern Illinois University. And I want to thank all four of you. You've been awesome. Thanks for sharing in a busy, busy job, your time with uh, law school candidates and with LSAC. And so with that, I wanna let the candidates know how happy we are they've joined us. I wanna say goodbye and thanks to the Dean so they can get on to their next meeting. And I wanna let you know that our staff will stay on for a little bit uh, to see if they can answer some more questions that you have. But if you don't get your question answers today, tune back in with a future webinar of LSAC and please always start with lsac.org because we're here to help you. It's our goal to help make that enrollment process one that is successful and that is smooth for you. So let us know how we can help and let us know how we can help connect you to the law school where we know you will thrive. Thanks for being with us today. Visit lsac.org to learn more.